This is a team that uh, has worked hard for 13 weeks and they're going to discuss motion in VR. So please uh, join me in welcoming them. Thank you for that introduction, Patrick. As he said, we're on studios. We're a team of six, actually, but there's uh, four of us that are presenting today. I'm Parmita. This is Jim's, Robin, and Hua. Actually, Mateo's behind the camera. <laughs> Fred's in Denmark. Uh, we're also fortunate enough to have our client with us, Jonathan Dowdswell. He's in the audience there. Uh, we're under NDA for some elements of our project, but we're fortunate enough to share a presentation with you today on motion simulation. Uh, first, we'd like to play a video uh, that will explain the product and the journey overall. It's a bit long, so bear with us. We are ARM Studios, a group of graduate students at the Center of Digital Media in Vancouver. Our mission is to expand the boundaries of VR by creating a public narrative experience in a physically immersive environment. When we were considering how to develop VR theater, we found that there's nothing like it on the market at the moment. The Void, an experience in New York and Dubai, comes close, but it doesn't have the live improvised interactions with actors. We tried to combine the best of VR gaming and video with escape rooms and live theater. We ended up with a unique mixed reality experience that required a lot of technical and design innovations. Our client is Jonathan Dalswell of LA System a veteran of the gaming industry who has served in the senior roles of Blackbird Interactive, Relic Entertainment and EA. With 13 weeks to develop, we spent the first 7 weeks on research and development in order to develop a technical design and narrative framework that we could present as a proof of concept. Once we had the client approval based on our proof of concept, we proceeded into a full production. There were several technical challenges. We first needed to expand the play space to maximize the sense of distance traveled during the walking experience of the game. We extended the Vive's play area to well above the recommended limit, and we also placed interactable objects at different edges of the play area to make users think they were walking to completely different areas in the space. Object interaction was the next challenge we had to solve. We needed to have players be able to interact with physical props. A major constraint was that we didn't have access to the Vive trackers or any tools like additional 3D sensors or cameras beyond what's included with the Vive. This was the area we struggled with the most, but we devised a calibration system to fix alignment issues using the controller. We also had to arrange objects in such a way that nothing obscured the Vive headset and controllers from the lighthouses. We experimented with Leap Motion and Connect for user avatars, but both these technologies have too many limitations to work with our product. Creating immersive motion simulation was a long journey for us. There are no VR games that combine motion simulation and normal walking, and most VR driving or flying experiences are nauseating. Our client also wanted the user to be able to control their own movement, so we needed to design a control system whose inputs could be integrated within Unity. For our spaceship, we minimized nausea through gradual acceleration, limited rotations of movement, a horizon, and limiting the user's field of view with a vignette effect, as well as reducing the view through the spaceship's window of their moving environment. The experimental nature of our project forced us to collaborate closely and develop a unique pipeline, since we were dealing with so many unknowns. The programming, art, and physical design had to be seamless. For example, when you push a physical lever in your experience, it needs to correspond to a movement and action in VR. When we would design a feature, we would start with an idea, work simultaneously on the design of the artwork, physical props, sound, and programming, and then try to combine them. And it was during the synthesis of all of these elements that we'd learn how we'd need to adapt it to get it working. Then we'd be ready for more public tests to enhance usability, which inevitably led to more refinements and iterations. On the design side, we needed to develop a narrative framework that was centered around the user's experience and movement. We had to balance the user's freedom and choices within the split narrative and create a flow that pushed the user towards the ending. We turned to site-specific theater and uh, interactions like Sleep No More and Escape Rooms for inspiration. The user interacts and improvises with two actors and becomes a third character in the story. 
The script was broken down by each queue, detailing what the user action needed to be in that moment, along with stage management directions for the crew and suggested dialogue for the actors. The script was a living document which needed to be continually modified and improved during the two-week rehearsal period to add clarity and to deepen engagement. Our development process was agile, and we needed to not only adapt the dialogue, but also the physical and virtual design according to the user's feedback and needs. The production is mixed reality which informed design of the set, costumes, lights, and sound. The experience begins and ends in a spaceship, and the set was built to emulate the virtual design of a ship to create a more seamless experience when the user puts on the and take off their headset. With the 3D design, the biggest challenge was making the RSS match with the physical setup, while also maintaining fidelity to ensure immersion. To solve the problem, we keep the same measure of units between Cinema 4D, Unity, and the physical production. Before we begin modeling, we create a 5x5 meter plan as a reference for the working area and imported a 3D model of an average sized person to represent the user. Based on those reference points, we designed the size and scale of other objects. After several rounds of modification, we finally aligned the parameters between the physical props and their VR content props. We also created architectures to make the control panel Luca Watson in VR. Based on the digital version of the spaceship and its controllers, a physical version was designed in lower resolution. For the physical prototype of the console, we used materials like wood, cardboard, and paint to quickly build a proof of concept. On the other hand, the physical design of the key influenced the virtual design, so it would be easier to build with what we had at hand. We used a plexiglass box, a valve controller, and two 3D printed handles to build our prototype, so the lighthouses from the vibe would detect the controller. The Hans Zimmer inspired music was originally composed, featuring a recurring theme that persists through all the tracks. The sci-fi setting let us use weird, interesting sound effects. The music and audio really enhanced immersion for the users and served as an affordance to guide the users through the story. The final product is a VR theater production of a space adventure called The Rookie, in which you play a space technician training on your first day of work. You soon find out that a dimensional converter has malfunctioned, threatening to collapse realities. Our experience draws you to new surreal worlds and corporate intrigue as you interact with your environment to solve puzzles and engage with actors. Our final performances and users' tests of The Rookie were very successful. While calibration issues remained, we found that users were deeply immersed and wowed by the experience. As an area of artistic and technical innovation, VR theater is incredibly promising and we're proud to have produced an interactive experience like this. That concludes our presentation. <laughs> um, uh, today we're going to share uh, more about our development journey with motion simulators, uh, detail some of the design challenges we went through, like the constraints, the calibration issues, affordances, distances traveled, and uh, issues with nausea. And we'll end with some of our takeaways. Many developers struggle with how to move in VR. We developed a few solutions, but today we're just going to be focusing on the motion simulator vehicles we developed. Uh, at the outset, our design question was, uh, how might we create a public VR theater experience with motion simulation and a narrative? So motion simulation for us was not really Mario Kart or a racing game. Uh, it needed to balance the narrative. And what we ended up with was that uh, motion simulation tied together all of the features and allowed the player to explore the world of the story and progress through. So we had just 13 weeks to develop our final deliverable. And when we first uh, received the brief, we were entirely new not just to building motion simulators, but to developing in VR itself. Uh, our first three weeks involved just researching the available tech in VR and AR. We ended up with the Vive. Um, but to learn, you have to build. 
There's a growing body of research about VR, but this product is unique. We're on the frontier of VR, so rapid prototyping was our main source of knowledge. We conducted weekly internal tests and regular user tests. Uh, within our first week, actually, we did our first user test using two existing games, Unseen Diplomacy and Rail Adventures. And by working with existing products, we were still able to answer UX questions by getting a sense of what the user's needs and pain points may be with motion simulation. It took us eight weeks to complete our research and develop a technical proof of concept that involved a prototype of a car. We used found objects in the school's storage. For instance, the uh, ship wheel, you can see here actually, <laughs> happened to be the right height uh, for our seated driving experience. It was actually an old prototype that a student had developed years ago. Uh, and we, we used it, it was great. Uh, the technical proof of concept allowed us to expand our concept of what the product could be and to understand its full potential. We then developed a narrative and a plan for the final deliverable. And we had just one month to develop the final deliverable and the narrative and everything, built the sets, everything you saw in that video. So uh, today, we'll um, get into depth on some of these design challenges uh, that we explored and the solutions we applied. I'll start us off by talking about the constraints. So we've already talked about our limitations in resources. But it should be said that by using found objects and tapping into our networks, like my former employer, the Arts Club Theatre Company, thank you Arts Club, and by using Craigslist, we were able to deliver far under budget. I only spent about $128 on the whole thing. Uh, and I think we're proof that you can develop chip cheaply and quickly if you're resourceful. And with regard to time, we were not only limited to just the 13-week time frame to develop, but also the length of the experience. We set out to create a 10 to 15 minute VR experience that was accessible to anybody in the public. Uh, we wanted something my parents or your grandparents could walk into, learn easily and quickly, and just focus on enjoying themselves. So with accessibility as a major objective, the UX shaped the design of the final product completely. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim's to talk about one of our big challenges, calibration and alignment. Thanks, Pamida. Uh, uh, I would like to share some insight about uh, calibration. OK, uh, which was one of our biggest struggles. Uh, one of the greatest pain points we experience as a VR user is the desire to touch and interact with our virtual environment. When we reach out to touch objects, but they are low, no layer, they have sense the immerse, immersion is incomplete. This project offered the opportunity to complete the sense of immersion through interaction and the feedback between the user and the interactive environment especially for the control system of the motion simulator. As a mixed reality experience, we had to design both the physical and the virtual interface for control and ensure they are aligned. Our first user test was an existing motion simulator, Real Adventure, in which user did not control the direction. However, passively experiencing a simulator for two minutes without physically interacting with anything made the user feel bored. So this told us that we need to create a control system to give users the ability to direct their movement. <laughs> but it required building custom props they had to align with the VR experience. The car was the first prototype for which we create a custom prop. It includes a chair in front of a small tabletop with a USB steering wheel and the pedals on the ground. Everything has have to be taped down so the physical prop can be easily matched with the placement in VR. So in a virtual world, user will allow to drive in the car, travel around a city. It's much better for user to control where they, can, or where they like to go by holding a steering wheel instead of a controller. Uh, but for us, making acceleration, braking, and the steering feel natural was a big challenge. 
Once the calibration was off more than three inches, or if the user reached out to touch the object, but there are no in the real world, the immersion will be break. So they, they move more cautiously and the, the break the experience depend, depends on how badly the physical or virtual world is off from their expectations. We also find if the user wear the headsets before they see the physical setup, they struggle more. They make more assumptions about what they can or cannot interact in the VR. For our final deliverable, we design a bigger physical installation for the spaceship. We set up a room with a movable wooden walls, you can see in this video, and LED lights, as well as a control console with two levers. At the start of the experience, the user see the physical setup and wear the headset afterward in order to better understand how to interact with the environment. As a designers, we start by referencing arcade game that we use joystick to move like space invaders. By pushing the lift lever forward, you accelerate, pushing back to decelerate and brake. And by rotating the right lever, you control the direction of the spaceship. This system was the easiest for user to quick learn. Also, by transitioning from a sitting to standing experience, it's much simpler for user to to be natural learned and uh, stand in front of the control console than climbing in or out the car. And we would like to share some strategy like how we build the physical insulation to align with the virtual 3D models. When we began our design, we measured the physical site and make the exact reference size plan in the 3D software world. We created our set according to the reference size. In this way, we keep the measuring unit between physical and virtual consistent. Also, in order to make a smooth experience, uh, we, uh, <coughs> by, uh, when, when controlling the ship, we design the height of the console, the distance between two levers and the size of levers according to the economic standards, so it can fit for most of average high people. And in addition to the sizing, and positioning the 3D models and the props. We also install the LED lights with the same color in the installation, so make it tied together with the digital texture. By applying those strategies, we were able to make the calibration and alignment more seamless. Now I will turn to Robin to talk about affordance that will help, help users to navigate the world in VR. Okay, thanks, James. Wait, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so by affordances, we mean like anything that can guide the user into what they have to do. So visual, auditory, kinesthetic affordances. Um, so we found it difficult to figure out a good way to help users know where to go when they were driving uh, for the car prototype. We tried using colorful objects to indicate where they were supposed to go. So that red arrow is pointing to the building they were supposed to get to, and the blue patch of road is where they were supposed to park for the auto parking feature to kick in. Um, but the, a lot of the users didn't see the red arrow until we pointed it out, because when they're driving, you, they're looking at the road, not like at the sky. <laughs> um, but they all at least saw the blue patch of road. So this isn't ideal. It makes no sense in the story, and it didn't really help users that much, um, whereas we could have just you know, it, was, it didn't help as much as us telling the users what to do. Uh, so for the spaceship, uh, we had a lot more flexibility with affordances because of the sci-fi setting. Uh, we put speed and steering indicators on the spaceship's monitor. And instead of saying things like, oh, drive to the blue parking lot, we could say, <laughs> fly into the purple magnetic beam that will pull you into the space station, uh, which fit a lot better with the story. And it just made more sense because you're in space. And it was just a lot cooler. Uh, so we could get away with weird guidance systems like that and like glowing orbs uh, because it was set in space. All right, so micro distances. By micro distance, we mean the d distance between the player and the controls. Uh, for the car, uh, like Jim said, all the props were taped on the floor and the steering wheel and pedals were a fixed distance away from the chair. 
So this didn't work well with people who were shorter or taller than average because in real life we can adjust car seats to be the exact right size that we need. But for this one, like I could barely reach the pedals uh, with my feet, whereas Jonathan, our client, who's a lot taller, felt really cramped while driving. Um, so since the spaceship was a standing experience, users could comfortably stand at whatever distance they needed to hold the controls. Sorry, um, I hope you guys could hear that. <laughs> um, and yeah. So macro distances, uh, we mean the distance that the user travels in the experience in VR. So one of the main goals we had was to make the user feel like they had traveled a great distance over the course of the experience. So both the car and the spaceship were successful in doing this, but with the spaceship, the feeling of distance and scale was bigger in every way. We had the user fly the spaceship from the main space station to two other Skylabs some distance away. And we, they, when they got to the Skylab, they could look back and see the main space station and see the distance they had traveled and like also see you know, outer space and all these other places they could go, um, which was really cool. Whereas for driving the car, um, you just were kind of driving through the city and all you would see were buildings when you look back. And it was quite boring. Um, yeah, so with the spaceship, we succeeded in giving the user like a small open world to explore while also giving them enough guidance to complete their tasks with our affordances. Uh, yeah, and so Hua is gonna tell you about the nausea issues we ran into and solved. Thanks, Robin. Okay. Um, so as you know, um, nausea was, of course, uh, a major concern that and a focus of our research one of the reasons why we get nauseous in VR is that it looks like we are moving in VR, but our body is actually standing still. So this creates a contradiction between what you see in VR and what your inner ear actually senses. And the, re the result is nausea. So for instance, in our first prototype, we made out the car um, run, accelerate, turn, and brake pretty quickly like the rear cars. But since we didn't have any haptic feedback to trick our inner ears, um, the user ended up getting a little nauseous. Another thing is that we initially added uh, colliders on the car and the environment, but we found that if you drove into a curb of the sidewalk, the car would flip and you would basically just see the whole VR world turn in a circles through your car's windshield. That was probably the <laughs> most nauseating VR experience I have ever had in my life. So as you can see here, <laughs> this is a picture that James, thank you James, uh, that James took of me recovering from that horrible experience. We actually had to end a work day just because also Pramida and Robin had to lie down on the couch the entire day after that. So I, I didn't feel like a little nauseous when talking about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after some researches, we found uh, two approaches for this problem. So either we have to have feed haptic feedback to trick your inner ears, or we have to make the player see less of their motion. For the former approach, one of the idea was to have the motion similar to chair, like in some arcade racing game. However, it was not a feasible solution for us because of our limited um, the resources and that we are not the students from engineering school, of course. <laughs> uh, so we decided to solve the problem by uh, reduce how much motion the user can see in VR. In the second prototype, we replaced the car by the spaceship with the slower acceleration and steering. We also removed all kind of collisions and out of force that can unexpectedly cause some abrupt stops or a sudden change in the spaceship's movement. Um, therefore, there'll be no such crazy situation that the spaceship could flip around. Um, and the players will always be in full control of their movement and will feel less nauseous. And finally, we also added some vignette effect on a camera view. Um, the spaceship's window frame was also made to be smaller than the cars which um, also like to, to constrain the player's field of view, which also has a positive effect on uh, reducing nausea in VR. So by using all of those techniques that I talked about, we successfully reduced the number of players actually felt nauseous uh, after the experience. 
for the last prototype, only 6% of them felt nauseous. But all of those actually had some problems with their inner ears before. So to sum up the presentation, I want to talk about the lesson that we learned during the project. None of us had experience developing in VR before this project, so we learned a lot. We learned uh, that there's so much more you need to consider when developing for VR than for a normal on-screen kind of experience. Firstly, one of the key takeaway when working with unknowns like in this project is that you, sh you have to learn from doing and rapidly prototype with what we already have at hand. This would help you save a lot of time and resources. Uh, for instance, in our project, we used two existing games that Premier talked about um, and the pre-built ships will that a previous cohort actually made to um, uh, build our own prototype. And secondly, about the calibration problem. Uh, it is still an ongoing problem to most of the VR experience uh, today. So one of the, uh, the, the example was um, the Void one of the most popular public VR experience in New York that Premier tried last month. They still have um, a calibration problem despite their state-of-the-art technology that they are currently have. Mm, so therefore, we don't think that the current technology could get us over it. However, a suitable environment with a well-designed natural inter interaction with a um, control system would make the user become more forgiving about. And third, about macro distances. It plays a very important role in motion simulator in VR. Our test pointed out that people would enjoy uh, moving in the universe, like from the space station to another one, better than driving around the city, even though that it is a beautiful city like Paris. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of tricks and tools to make the user believe that they are moving in a great distance in VR. For example, we can play with the scale by putting the user in a bigger virtual world like in the universe. Um, and finally, about the nausea. After a lot of uh, researches and experiments, we can conclude that reducing the amount of motion that the players could see in VR is a very efficient way to reduce the nausea in VR. Uh, it can conclude, uh, it, sorry, it can include um, reducing the acceleration in steering, removing all kind of unexpected motion in VR, and constraining players' field view. We have now delivered and handed the project to our client, Jonathan, and he'll be developing this further and in different directions. He's developing business model for it and looking for invest investment. And he's right here. <laughs> if any of you are interested, uh, I don't really. <laughs> We'd also like to see it develop further with multiple um, multiplayer interaction, motion tracking using high-tech equipment, and higher resolution props. We will also have a demo at the after party at the Center for Digital Media after this. So we'd love to talk about um, it with you. So that's the end of the, our presentation. We want to thank you for your listening and give our special thanks to our client, Jonathan Dowswell, our advisor, performer, and amazing MC today, Patrick Penefather. <laughs> and I want to say thank you to everybody who helped us in construction and testing. Thank you. We are ready for your question. Awesome. <laughs> thanks, all. Thanks, team. <laughs>